Good afternoon. If there were any doubts you might have uh, had coming into these meetings this weekend about whether or not we're into an energy revolution, I think those doubts will be dispelled by the time that you leave because of the number of presentations we have on it. The industrial revolution or the, indu the, the energy revolution that we're going to be seeing uh, is one thing. The ability to control that revolution, the ability to coordinate it, the ability to bring to bear bottom line figures and human dignity considerations, that's something we have barely yet scratched the surface on. And that's what I want to talk about real briefly uh, this afternoon. The coordination is the biggest challenge we're going to face. And we really have only two alternatives. One is we get ahead of that curve and we structure it. Or secondly, we get pulled kicking and screaming into this revolution that's going to be occurring anyway. There really are no other alternatives. Those two choices are essentially going to determine whether we get this right or get this wrong. And what I put up here on this first slide about getting things wrong, if you go back into the history of Pennsylvania and what occurred in 19th century coal, there are a lot of industrial advantages from it. There was a lot of human misery from it as well we run the risk of doing the same sort of thing with the new developments in energy. And that's one of the things that we desperately have to avoid. There are changes coming. Some of them are already here. You read about them all the time. We haven't worked out the implications, but everybody is already posturing them all over them. These game changers, the unconventional production, you've heard several times already today, we're in the middle of one of them called the Marcello Shale. Now to give you some perspective, I do consulting all over the world. Uh, in fact, over the last four months, I've been on three continents. I leave for Frankfurt again on Tuesday. To, to give you a frightening idea, for example, whenever I go over to Germany to talk about shale gas, the Germans assume that whatever comes out of Harrisburg is going to dictate what shale gas producers do in the rest of the world. Why? Because we're eight years ahead of them. That's all. That's all you need to be in a business like this. It's light years. Well, we've known about the unconventional production for a while, but we've had no clue about how much energy potential there is. You go back to 2005, and I remember sitting in meetings in which we were discussing how much liquefied natural gas we'd, had to, we'd have to import into the United States by 2020. And at that point, of course, everyone was talking to the Cove Point, Maryland facility, uh, Dominion Energy's facility, the largest LNG receiving facility on the East Coast, trying to figure out how we could upgrade that, how we could increase the, the volume. The figures out there were from 0.3% to 15% of the American economy was going to be built upon LNG we imported from other countries. That's six years ago. Today, we're not talking about importing anything. In fact, we're talking about major exporting initiatives because of the unconventional shale gas that we're discovering. We could, without any major effort beyond what currently exists today, increase the amount of natural gas we produce annually by 25% in North America. If we wanted to do that, destroy a market and do a number of other things, but we could do that in terms of all the volume that suddenly has appeared. How do we know these things are changing rapidly? Dominion Energy several weeks ago quietly applied to retrofit half of their facility as an export facility. What are they going to do with it? They're going to take the natural gas coming from the Marcellus, turn it into LNG, and sell it to Europe. Can you do that? Canadians have already told us how. The Canadians are building three LNG facilities. One is at Kitimat on the British Columbia coast. I was up there for a meeting a couple of weeks ago. Kitimat is currently under construction. When, when the Canadians first put this on Blueprint, it was to be one of three major importing facilities. When it's open four years from now, every bit of that facility will be exporting LNG to Asia. That's how quickly these things change. Now, given the importance of Marcellus on the East Coast, Pittsburgh is right in the center of this unconventional changing. And it's not simply shale gas. We've got coal bed methane. We've got tight gas that occupies sandstone lenses. We even have hydrates, rather dangerous, but we have a considerable amount of hydrates, especially off the Alaskan coast. So if all the people talking about climate change are correct, and in a couple of years when we start buying our summer vacation homes up on the northern coast of Alaska, we can start developing those hydrates as well. We've got oil shale. We've got heavy oil. We've got bitumen. 
all of those traditional sources that we thought essentially were moving by the board, we now understand we have a much greater volume of them. Now that's both an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is you have to keep revising the peak oil issue because it doesn't look like we're running out of oil. The disadvantage is number one, this unconventional costs a great deal more to put online, especially when it comes to unconventional oil, than what it is we're used to. And number two, it doesn't force us to deal with the essential coordination problems, which finally gets me back to what it is I'm discussing today. We need to integrate existing sources of energy with the unconventional coming online. We need to be able to integrate these with uh, the um, coal and coal gasification, the coal to liquids, the gas to liquids, the new renewables, the alternative energies, developments in nuclear. Nuclear has been taking a pounding recently because of certain events uh, in Japan. At the same time, we've had developments of magnificent new small nuclear batteries that are completely self-encased, that can be used for entire communities, that don't require any maintenance whatsoever, and you merely replace them every 18 to 35 years. And that market was expanding considerably, especially in places in the world where it's just too expensive to build the infrastructure to build in the conventional or to bring in the conventional energy. Those approaches aren't going anywhere. As the Germans decide that they're phasing themselves out of nuclear, we have a ramp up in terms of the nuclear reactor facilities that will be built in China, that will be built in India. This market is moving throughout the world, but the market certainly isn't over. The problem with each of these energies is they're looked at insular, they're looked at as if they're insular sources. We need to be able to integrate them. If we don't, there's going to be downsides, both in terms of efficiency and also in terms of the impact this is going to have on the lives of average people. The infrastructure needs I talk about here are rather clear. Uh, we see this every day. That structure that's necessary to deliver energy, regardless of what the energy source is, requires constant expansion. In the case of pipelines in the United States, upwards to 60% of those pipelines will have to be replaced by the time we get to 2020. They're just simply too old. As the infrastructure gets replaced, it would be nice to upgrade it to something that's more efficient and something that actually gives us a better feel for what's going on. None of that planning is really being done now. The whole planning I mentioned here goes, this is all the planning from the public sector folks setting up the regulations down to the individuals who are actually running the efficiency charts uh, for field managers, the people who are actually developing uh, the fields and actually extracting uh, the energy. Risk assessment's already been talked about. Jerry just talked about it. I do a lot of risk assessment. Uh, my risk assessment situations, I'm at Duquesne University. I'm the scholar in residence at their Institute for Energy and the Environment. I also run two of my own companies that do international oil and gas consulting on the one hand and global risk management on the other. Now, what we've learned about doing global risk management is nobody knows what it means. But they do know that it, there's a real big risk problem out there. And if we don't know how to solve it, we have to hire somebody from the outside to do it. Now, everybody knows why. There's a corollary to Murphy's Law. And that corollary says during a time of crisis, an administrator who is smiling has figured out somebody to blame it on. If you hire somebody from the outside and it doesn't work, you've got somebody to blame it on. So we walk in and out of situations all the time. And one of the things I've recognized is that everybody understands risk as a problem, and everybody thinks they know what they do for a living, regardless of what the company is, and they'll do a risk assessment project in terms of how to avoid getting people killed on the shop floor and getting disgruntled customers and so on and so forth, uh, how to get a better return from their loans and these sorts of things. But when it comes to what about the risk assessment to your stakeholders? What about the risk assessment to the people in the community as a whole that you're supposed to be serving? They don't have a clue. And you know what they do? They'll give me a number and say, call up our PR department. That's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about who puts out the press releases when something goes very, very wrong. We're talking about how do you integrate this into a wider need, into a local need, into a community need, into a national need, into an international need. With energy, very little of that's been done. And it's absolutely essential. Uh, the coordinating services here run the gamut of everything that's essential in delivering 
and distributing energy. MLPs and new holding structures are something I'm spending a fair amount of time on these days. You may have heard about it. There are these things called master limited partnerships. Master limited partnerships are the new sweetheart way in which you run pipelines. Oh, you also run midstreams, those people who gather and do the initial processing, provide the storage, provide the terminal capacity, and so on. But essentially, people see this in terms of pipelines. Well, what does this mean? It means that the pipelines themselves are being owned by certain partnerships in which all of the profits move to the partners. There are no corporate taxes whatsoever. If that MLP decides to spin out an equity position from that, in other words, a share issuance, now that percentage of the profits automatically goes to average shareholders as dividends. And we look at some of these companies, and many of these companies I'm tracking are giving annualized dividends between 12 and 20 percent. It looks really great. Guess what? There's no model for this. There's no way of coordinating for this. There's no way of figuring out how these new holding structures actually impact on the overall delivery of energy. Let's face it, the guys who are developing the MLPs hold the midstream crux in all of this. You got guys here developing the oil and gas. You got people here who use it. The guys in the middle are making a greater amount of money by delivering it from point A to point B, and we don't really have a clue over what the acceptable model ought to be. So we've got legal and financial coordinations rather than the traditional ones we think about. And then the last one I put here is really the most important one. How do we control the impact? How do we control the effects? The human effects, the environmental, the adverse environmental impacts, the economic transitions. Everybody talks about, well, the Marcellus Shale Coalition talks about how much money is generated by Marcellus drilling and how many jobs it's creating. An earlier speaker today talked about many of those jobs don't last very long. But there's a downside economically that nobody's ever even saw, even seen yet in terms of the localities. It's something we've been working on for years at the Institute at Duquesne, and that is what are the downside localized economic consequences from the apparent short-term economic boom? How do you set up regula regulations that uh, pass the muster of state uh, legislation, for example, state statute, while at the same time trying to figure out what the net impact is? The drillers come and go. The disadvantages tend, tend to stay for a great deal of time, uh, from destroyed roads to localized inflation. I'll give you, I have to be careful. After 30 years, I've got tons of stories. My graduate students know these. If they don't feel like studying, apparently these are notes that come down from semester to semester. You know, and they'll say, look, if you're at this point and he looks tired, ask him this question. He'll tell this story. You, you won't get any work done. And that works, until they re that works until they realize they're still accountable for the information, whether we get through a lecture in or not. So, um, but let me just give you a story. We have a situation in central Pennsylvania in which one of the township committeemen first called me up and said, look, if I see another uh, pickup truck with an Oklahoma license plate, I'm going to shoot somebody. But then, secondly, he says, I now understand what you mean by localized inflation. He says, I had a problem in my uh, bathroom. I asked the local plumber, and then he goes on to give me a story because everybody in this town went to high school together. So he's known this guy for years. And he charged me three times what it was worth the last time he came in. And I asked him why, and he said, all these joints now are needed out at the drilling sites. So you've got all of these economic dislocations that are taking place, and nobody's doing very much, if anything, about actually being able to, to deal with it. The two components we're talking about here are the hard side. Those are the guys who do the extracting, who process, who move the energy. Uh, the research and development, the distribution networks, the midstream companies that I've already talked about. And here's the soft side. The soft side deals with a range of planning. It deals with a range of legal and economic needs. The logistics, the coordination, the implications, the risk assessment. All of that has to be coordinated. All of it is done now, if it's done at all, after the fact, and it's done in a very piecemeal, inefficient way. And primarily, there's no overall long-range planning here. And that's the essential difficulty. Here's the approach I'm suggesting. We need a hub for soft side solutions. It has to be integrative, proactive, and flexible. I think those are the three words everybody has to use these days. Uh, it has to be sensitive to the impact of the major changes that are taking place to the people in the communities in which these things are occurring. You utilize existing strengths. And ladies and gentlemen, the Pittsburgh area is better at the existing strengths I have in mind than any other place in the world that I've spent any time at. 
That long list gives you what we need. We already have all of them. Not only that, if you take a look at, at, uh, at toward the bottom, we're already world famous for having posed and solved major urban problems. We're all justly proud about the reformation of, Pence, uh, of, of Pittsburgh, turning a smoky little town into, according to Rand McNally, the most livable city. What you don't understand, unless you spend a lot of time abroad, is everybody knows that. They assume that Pittsburgh has posed and solved the most important, significant, difficult urban planning problem of the 20th century, and Pittsburgh is the place you go if you want to look for solutions to the next wave. We've already sold that internationally. We don't have to do any PR whatsoever. The fact, the fact that we may not know what happens next, <laughs> that may be something else again. But hey, you know, that's, that's why movies have sequels, right? <laughs> now that we have recent examples, uh, the Allegheny Conference, one of the sponsors of, of TEDx Pittsburgh, the, the Power of Pittsburgh program they, ha they have is now a major initiative in terms of, for the first time, trying to integrate some of these elements together in a way that makes some sense. The Institute for Energy and the Environment at Duquesne University that we've set up has been designed to deal only with the soft side. There are other people like down the street at Carnegie Mellon that can deal with the technical side. In, in fact, everybody got a little book and you're supposed to find the guy who actually owns it. You know, okay. Well, I found mine this morning. Turn, turns out to be Dr. Kozla. I don't know if he's still here, who's, who's the dean of, ener uh, of, of engineering at Carnegie Mellon. They just happen to be setting up uh, an energy futures institute to merge technology needs with, with overall planning needs. So there are plenty of things that are already happening in Pittsburgh this thing I call the Pittsburgh solution uh, already has the elements here. We have challenges. The challenges we essentially have to come to grips with is not to walk into the new energy age with our eyes closed because people are going to be hurt and people don't need to be hurt. This can be bipartisan. It can be replicated other places in the country regardless of which party happens to be in control. It's global in impact. Every single time I go to another country, I have the same kinds of questions. How are you people in the United States solving the following? And the answer is, we're not. We're not because there isn't a place in which we bring all of this together. It's what I suggest for Pittsburgh. Now, does this sound, fami sound familiar? This is what Renaissance 1 and 2 did. You guys could do what you do for a living out there. You set up your corporations here. I'm suggesting the same thing now, but to do it in energy. We become the center of this new age. Houston can remain the center of traditional hydrocarbons if they wish. I've got two last challenges here, very briefly. One to the university community. In 1907-1908, the Pittsburgh survey was accomplished. It's still the single most famous study of an American city ever done. The list of uh, works you see here are the most famous seminal early works in urban sociology, well known to, to, to social scientists. And thanks to the University of Pittsburgh Press, they're still in print. People still turn to these. We need to have another one, folks. We need to have a second Pittsburgh challenge, a, a second Pittsburgh survey of how a city in a region copes with the vast new energy complications. It's going to have a tremendous impact internationally. My last challenge is to the region as a whole. With everything else that's going on, we need to get this one right. If we don't, we're going to be doing one of the cruelest injustices to the next couple of uh, generations. Thank you very much.